السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So today we're going to be continuing on with the companions of the cave and one thing um, just quite coincidentally that happened is we had the Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, Good Friday holiday around the spring equinox and I figured that it might be a good idea to kind of merge these two stories um, regarding the crucifixion as well as the companions of the cave because if you remember from part one one of the companions of the cave is meant to be crucified so we're going to talk about the crucifixion as well as a lot of stories from the Bible, how they relate to the Quran, and basically figuring out, well, the question is, if Isa al-Masih, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, if he was not crucified, then who was? Because clearly there is a memory that someone was, or it was made to appear that it was Jesus Christ. But what we're going to show you is that the Quran actually gives you hints as to who that person is. Uh, but before we get to that, it's good to establish what the historical context is at that time. Because the Bible seems to duplicate events at will, as if to scatter all the pieces of the true story, which the Quran enlightens us about. So this is the contention here is Yusuf has two companions one of them sees in a dream that he's pressing wine and the other says I see myself carrying above my head bread and the birds are eating from it so they ask Yusuf their companion in the prison to inform them of what these dreams mean and Yusuf very plainly says to the other one, the one who had a dream that bread is on his head and the birds are eating from it, that he will be crucified and the birds will eat from his head. It's a matter decreed, meaning it's going to happen whether he likes it or not. It's just the future. So this person here, because... Joseph's story in the Bible is separated from Moses' story, is separated from the Jesus Christ story, is separated from so many other stories in the Bible. We have no idea. We are told that this person is just some random person in the Bible that Pharaoh executes, called the baker. He's even called the baker because he, in his dream he has bread. We're going to get to all of this. But this is the main thing, is when you look at this root for crucifixion, this person, this verb is only used in the mention of Jesus Christ. Salabuhu. They crucified him not. Wama salabuhu. They crucified Isa al-Masih, the son of Mary, not. And this person says he will be crucified. So right off the bat, there's two possible people to be crucified in this event. One of them is one of Yusuf's companions, and the other one is Isa, the son of Mary. And we already know that the son of Mary is not. So this leaves only one person that uses this verb. The other thing that's very interesting, we'll have to get into eventually um, near the end, is that there are individuals that are threatened with crucifixion and we can see very plainly the person that is often crucified this is a penalty that is done towards those who strive upon the earth corruption in the land okay or that they be exiled and when you look at who is the one that orders crucifixion it is actually the Pharaoh of Musa's time, Pharaoh. He will crucify who? 
he will crucify those magicians okay on the trunks of the palm trees jadur and nakhl and basically he is threatening these magicians if you know the story in the quran because they acknowledge the god of musa and harun they acknowledge allah and so Pharaoh gets really mad and threatens him with this major penalty, which only God is able to give, right? This is only a penalty that Allah gives. But obviously Pharaoh looked at himself as God. What's interesting is this trunks of palm trees. Notice that there is no mention of crucifixion upon any construction. Um, I will even show you that the term crucifixion as a translation is a bit of a misnomer because there are many different types of this torture mechanism that if you just imagine what the Christians believe happened to Jesus Christ, it doesn't make a lot of sense because in the Quran it says in the trunks of the palm trees. And I'll show you an nakhl very likely doesn't refer to palm trees. The reason being that this punishment happens within their trunks. And we know that Miriam finds herself before she conceives. I think after she conceives Isa ibn Maryam in chapter 19, she finds herself near a trunk of the palm tree. Okay, So clearly a palm tree does not have the ability to hold the same configuration that Jesus' crucifixion happened. Nor can they be crucified in the trunk. Fi jodur. And so clearly there's more to the story. Now Firaun utters this command three times. Okay. And I find that significant because this appears to be threatening three magicians, three people. Here, we have one person claimed to be crucified and another actually in his stead that actually will be crucified. So clearly the, the quantity of these terms in each root of the Arabic language in the Quran has significance. And then what we have here is a reference to the backbone, as-sulb, okay, the backbone. Now, here it's translated aslabikum, your backbones, because the sacrum, which is the bottom of the spine, is related to procreation of the human race. But this is interesting too, because the word for crucifixion and cross is actually related to rigidity of the spine, the backbone, which we all have. We all have this trunk. We even call a trunk in the body, in human anatomy. So let's look a bit at the etymology in the Arabic language of sulb. See here we have samar, hindi, sulb. This is a variety of bamboo. Again, something rigid that goes straight up and down like a stake, like a trunk of a tree, like the spine of a human, like an axis of the world's. Here we have sulb al hard as stone, something that's solid. Okay. Now we get into the actual root, salaba. To become or be hard, firm, solid, stiff, rigid, solidify, harden, set, stiffen. In the Bible that it says, you know, like their their necks are stiff, right? I think even in the Quran there's some uh, you know similar idea to that. The spinal column is called solib, right? Crucifixion happens along the axis. It also the same with hanging and the same with impalement as well. These are all different versions of the same thing. Sulb. Sulb. So salib. Salb means crucifixion. Um, Maslub is a crucifix. Sulb means something firm, solid, rigid, robust, stubborn, iron will. Something solid is in a state of matter, solids. Steel, like iron and steel, 
the spinal column, the lumbar region, which is where procreation happens near the lumbar region, the backbone, the spine, the spinal column. Lumbar pain is called alam, pain of the sulb, the backbone. Loins are also related to the backbone. It's the same word, your backbones and the backbone, the spine. The spine of a book also is the backbone of a book, just like the axis of the mundi, the axis of the worlds. The text or body of a book, the core or essence of something in the center, the innermost part of something in three-dimensional space. Something that's hard and firm. Solib is a crucifix or a cross. There's so many different versions of this. The Crusades are named Solibiyi. Okay. Hardness, callousness. Something that is made rigid. Okay. And so when we look at in Genesis, this is the story of Yusuf. So the story of Yusuf is very similar because whoever conceived of the Bible understood the Quran and understood the story there. They just divided the story um, across many different books of the Bible so that you don't realize it's all happening around the same time in the same historical context. So, of course, the king in the Bible is called Pharaoh. And it's his birthday, and he has a feast for all of his servants. There is one who gives him wine as a cupbearer. Again, just like Yusuf's companion in the prison. They try to make it similar, but it doesn't work because the Quran connects these stories identically. And then the other one, who is his baker with bread, is impaled. Okay? So this this is an impaling on a post, okay, like a pole. But look where the translations differ here. In the King James Version, it says that he hanged this companion of Joseph's prison. Okay, he hanged him versus impaled. Here it says the king hanged the baker. Notice how Pharaoh can also be king in the Bible, depending what what type of translation you're looking at. And he's hanged on a pole as well, like a rod. Here we have hanged, but here we have impaled. Again, fulfilling Yusuf's dream. And remember, Firaun in the Quran threatens with hanging. How could that be different to this biblical Pharaoh? When the Quran shows you that crucifixion is ordered by Firaun, and this companions of Yusuf, one of them is hanged. And it's clearly not Isa ibn Maryam. He impaled the chief baker, as Yusuf had predicted when he interpreted his dream. And the chief cupbearer forgot all about Yusuf. So they took these they took these verses from the Quran and they just made a different story out of it. Slightly different story. But we're told the Quran is basically the biblical story. So again, you're going to see that the biblical story needs further analysis because the Quran points to something more significant. Now here we have the chief baker was beheaded and impaled on a pole. All of a sudden there's beheading as well. So it's not just a one size fits all punishment. And there's many different punishments in history to show this. When we look elsewhere in the Bible, officially this story is nowhere in the Quran. But I'm going to show you that it's very much in the Quran because the Quran doesn't need to play these games duplicating stories. Notice this person is not in Egypt in the Quran. He's actually in Persia. And so a lot of people will point that the Quran is inaccurate. But really, the Bible is the one that creates the problem. The Quran is just telling you exactly what happened. This person is an official of Pharaoh. And again, was he hanged or impaled or crucified? Jews today cannot make up their mind because these seem to be interchangeably used in the old world. 
it says that Haman wanted to slaughter the Israelites. And so he was punished because he caused corruption in the earth by hanging, hanging on the gallows. This is what the Old Testament shows in the King James Bible, that he was hanged. And we're going to get into who Queen Esther is, actually. There are some depictions of what happened to him. And when you look at it, too, this is in Deuteronomy, someone that's guilty of a capital offense. They hanged on a wood. Okay. So, you know, it's also referenced with Joshua as well, who we'll get into as well. But it can also mean impaling. Okay. To impale, not tree or gallows, but stake. Other mythologies have it as a tree. Like in the Quran. The Quran, the word of God tells you, the trunks of the trees. Now you could tell, you could say, well, they're harvested trees, but there's no evidence of that because it's inside their trunks. So impaling is also synonymous, it seems, with crucifixion. And when it comes to Haman, it seems to be that it should be translated as impaling, just like in Genesis, what happened to the one that was crucified. Impalement served as a method of execution, also a post-mortem rite of humiliating the corpses. So it's not just a form of execution, a form of humiliation as well. And this is an execution format of Persia, not Europe. So in the Bible, in the Greek, we see this word stauron used for the crucifixion of Jesus. This is how they translate the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the book of Esther for crucifixion. So a lot of people imagine that Haman, the advisor, the vizier to the king of Babylon, or the king of Persia rather, was crucified. And they even have poetry about how Jesus and Haman talk about their crucifixions. And in the past, the Roman emperor would actually prohibit Jews from setting fire to effigies of Haman because it looked very similar to effigies of the crucifix of Jesus. So when they see them burning their enemy, Haman, who tried to kill them on the festival of Purim, they thought that this was Jesus. There was so much confusion between Christians and Jews about the crucifixion, which tells you that there is something going on with this notion of crucifixion. And it's very significant to our true history. So we just look at the word crooks. And we use this not for a punishment today in English. We use this as a central problem for anything. The crux of the issue, the crux of the problem from the Latin crux, meaning a wooden frame for execution, but also to turn or to bend, to cross something. Today, in English, it means the central or essential point of feature, the critical or transitional moment of an issue or turning point, a puzzle or difficulty, the hardest point of a climb, Okay, something that's elevated. We look further in Dutch, means the same thing, a difficult problem, French, hardest point of a climb. And then in Latin, which is where we eventually get this word crux, nobody can make up their mind why this means cross today, because in earlier forms of the Latin language, crux refers to something turning or bending, compared to circus or circle or curve also a heap or a hill, again, something elevated, a summit in Gaulish, kruka, a small hill, pillar, again, pillar, just like a trunk. We have in Old Norse, ruga, heap, pile, raukas, heap, pile, rugia, spine or ridge. We know what a ridge is. That is not specifically just to do with a small thing. It's something in nature. Heap, hill, back, spine, all appear to be connected. Okay, elevated part of the world. And then later it became a wooden frame where criminals were crucified. A source of a gallows bird, someone deserving to be hanged. Again, 
crucifixion and hanging are almost synonymous, if not synonymous. Okay. The crucifixion itself is a method of capital punishment. And when you look further into it, um, it was a punishment used by Persians, Carthaginians, and Romans. Okay, these were all world empires. In Greek, we use the word stauros, which in modern Greek only means cross, but in antiquity was used for any kind of wooden pole, pointed or blunt, bare or with attachments. In the epistle to the Hebrews, prospegnomi, to fix or fasten, to impale, is synonymous with crucify. Okay? We have the word cross from the word crux. Any construction of wood or any tree, just like a nachla, a nachl, used to hang criminals as a form of execution, capital punishment. It means to fasten towards something. Crucifix, to fix towards a crux, to fix towards a spine, towards an axis. At times, the gibbet was only one vertical stake called crux simplex. So it doesn't have these arms coming out. It was just one pole where people were punished on there. Impaled, rather. And Josephus is the one that documents it. Sounds sort of like Yusuf, right? New Testament writings about the crucifixion of Jesus do not specify the shape of that cross, okay? But subsequent early writings liken it to the letter T, where tau is shaped exactly like crux commissa, represented the number 300. Notice that the number 300 is used in the story of the Companions of the Cave as well. I just thought that was interesting as well. And the word 300 is used in the Old Testament to be a mystical prefiguring of the cross of Christ. In these two illustrations, we see the crux simplex compared to the crucifixion of Jesus. So this is actually the, mo the oldest form of crucifixion. It just has an impalement or a hanging from one pillar or one, one wood or one trunk or one spine. Okay. To make you fixed or rigid towards a spine. Salabiya. Sulb. In 2023, an analysis of medical literature concluded that asphyxiation is discredited as the primary cause of death from crucifixion. Because this is how they explain the cross that Christians use today. That they would have asphyxi asphyxiated from shock. Um, and then we have in pre-Roman states, such as the Persians, Carthaginians, that impalement is the form of crucifixion. Not what we see today. It's actually impalement. This is in Carthage. Carthage, we're gonna talk about a queen that actually founded Carthage. And the word means new city. Qaryat is in the word Carthage. The reference is to being hanged from a tree and may be associated with lynching or traditional hanging. This is regarding Paul of Tarsus and also crucifixion in Deuteronomy 21. Again, hanging, impalement. Crucifixion is not what we've been told. And of course, notice in this picture, this is not a crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his followers or any other criminals alongside him. This is a mythological representation of criminals in Carthage where the birds eat from them. Okay? So again, it's the same idea. It's in the Quran. It's a universal event. And then we see in ancient Rome being impaled on a stake, okay, affixed to a tree, upright pole, or crux simplex. Notice it's a tree again. It's not a dead, dead wood. It's a living wood. Or to a combination of an upright, steepus, and crossbeam, patibulum. Crucifixion was intended to provide a death that was particularly slow, painful, excruciating, gruesome, humiliating, and public, and whatever means were most expedient for that goal. Methods varied considerably with location and period. In the ancient Roman custom, it was called, it was actually developed from a primitive custom called arbori suspendere, meaning suspended from a tree, hanging on an arbor infelix, inauspicious tree, dedicated to the gods of the netherworld. So you can see what 
crucifixion implies, why it was done. It's an offering to their jinns. Okay? So when you look at so many references to tree, there is no tree that we know of that fits this bill of something really significant happen, happening in the world. Crucifixion was intended to be a gruesome spectacle, and this is exactly how they portray it. A painful and humiliating death imaginable. Okay. So the people that do this are obviously, you can see, even in Islam, um, Sadaqat Kadri, a lawyer author, has called Islam's equivalent of hanging, drawing, and quartering that medieval Europeans inflicted on traitors. So this is only done to the worst possible people in the land. Okay? Those who wage war against Allah and his messenger. Spread corruption in the earth. This is not any common criminal. Okay? But interestingly that we have even medieval references, not just antique references, but medieval references to hanging, drawing, and quartering. And there's always the huge debate who this would apply to um, officially. We have Japan has the same idea, Burma. In Europe, even during World War I, we had these rumors of this taking place. And it basically goes full circle. All throughout the world, we have this concept. It's a universal concept. That's why it's mentioned in the Quran. So this method includes fire as well. And we do have a mention in the Quran about companions of the fire companions of the fire but also companions of the trench where they put people of God into a great fire and so this idea of hanging drawing and quartering was a penalty for high treason okay again in the kingdom of England the convicted traitor was fastened remember crucifix okay to a hurdle or wooden panel drawn by horses to a place of execution Again, it tells you that the story of Jesus, he had to bear his cross all the way to Golgotha, right? Calvary Hill. It's a hill. He was then hanged to this point, emasculated, disemboweled, beheaded, right? Just like, just like in certain translations in Genesis, decapitation, quartering, okay? Amputation, that's also mentioned. I will cut off your hands and feet. So all of this taken together is what the Quran encapsulates as happening in history. And so the 19th century legal reform actually made this illegal in England. The sentence of hanging, drawing, and quartering was changed to drawing, hanging until dead. So this is where we get hanging from. And then posthumous beheading and quartering before being completely abolished in 1870. Then the death penalty was abolished in 1998. So this is one medieval example. Even up until the 19th century, this is just a common occurrence. And the Quran acknowledges as part of our history. Okay. You're going to get into severed heads as well because um, in China we have a similar idea which is called Ling Qi or slow execution because crucifixion Again, it's related to fixing somebody to a pole. And my apologies if this is hard to stomach, but this is something we have to get through so you can understand what is actually going on. This is a form of execution where a knife was methodically removing portions of the body until eventually resulting in death. Again, especially heinous crimes such as treason, enemies of the state. Describes the difficulty, this the origin of the world describes the difficulty of travel on mountainous terrain, right? Because there's actually a traveling towards the place of execution. It's not just any ordinary place. It's a very specific site. Later on, it was describing the prolonged agony. They would tie the condemned person to a wooden frame, usually in a public place, as it was a public humiliation and a slow lingering death. Major offenses were those that were receiving this punishment, such as high treason, mass murder, genocide, patricide, matricide, petty treason, murder of one's master. 
ar arguing that extant photos of the execution clearly show death by division. And it says, cutting your hands, cutting your feet. Right? This is part of the... This is part of what happens. Even beheading would be part of that. Okay? Execution here on a pole as well. So, when we move on to impalement, you can see that this is a method of torture involving penetration of a stake, a pole, a spear, a hook. This is what solib means. Solib is your backbone. We, are, we essentially have a torso or a torus or a trunk in us, okay? And so this is just a, another version to mimic this cap for people that commit harsh form of capital offense, okay? Used to suppress rebellions, all right? So there was some kind of a war going on at the time because Musa had a faction, from his faction, and Firaun had a faction as well, his enemy, right? His enemy had a faction. So what we see here is by letting the stake follow the spine, the impalement procedure would not damage the vital organs and a person could survive for several days. Okay. We're told that on Good Friday, the crucifixion happened and on Sunday is when he died so that he resurrected on good on Easter Monday something of that nature I'm not too I'm not too versed on the details of Christianity so the idea is that impalement can prolong the punishment here we have hanging as well another pole this is a punishment in the Ottoman Turks as well who were called Romans Ottoman Turks were called Romans hang by the ribs in Pharaonic Egypt Prisoners of war were impaled, meaning caused to be set upon a stake to the south of Memphis following an attempted invasion of Egypt, again, a rebellion. The relevant determinant for a stake depicts an individual transfixed through the abdomen. Okay? So there's different forms, and it says here, um, this is the Assyrian king Ashur Nasser Paul II. I cut off their hands, I burned them with fire, a pile of the living men and of heads over against the city gate. I set up men I impaled on stakes, turned it into mounds and heaps. Okay. So in Persia, we also have this fate of Persian minister Haman, who was mentioned in Egypt. And his tens are, ten sons are also treated by different trans there's ambiguity whether they were impaled or hanged. Haman conspired to commit genocide on the Jews in the empire, and his plan was thwarted, so he was given the punishment that he tried to give to Mordecai. Um, hanging and impalement could be used interchangeably in this book of the Bible, exactly like in the book of Samuel. Some translators use impale, others use hang. The Neo-Assyrian method of impalement, as seen in carvings, could perhaps equally easily be seen as a form of hanging upon a pole, rather than focusing upon the stake's actual penetration of the body. This is very possible, but again, it doesn't rule out the fact that there is a penetration in the body. And it's, of course, Fir'aun is called the owner of the stakes. He's called Dhul Autad. So now we get an idea that there is more than one and that these stakes are related to an-nakhl, what they call the palm trees in the translation. So there's clearly some ambiguity, and all cultures have some idea of this, notably Vladimir the Impaler. Vladimir means ro world ruler. Oops. So Vladimir, the world ruler, it's like Pharaoh, the prince of Valachia, Dracula, is credited as the first notable figure to prefer this method of execution, and hence he was nicknamed Vlad the Impaler. He's also served a type of wine that flows through the human body called blood, and that's where the idea of Dracula came by. Just like Pharaoh, he was served wine as well. Yusuf says to his companion, you will serve wine to your, ma to your lord, right? Your lord at the time. In the Ottoman Empire, Impalement is also an execution style attested in Rome because Ottoman Empire was called Rome. 
and it goes on and on and on. The Armenian genocide as well has this scene of crucifixion. So it's not just one person. Even in the crucifixion story of Christianity in the New Testament, he is crucified along with two other people. There are three people that are shown to be crucified on the poles, the Autad. So basically the bodies were firmly fixed in the Armenian genocide. Some instances the stakes could not be withdrawn. Remember, crucifixion, hanging, impalement, hanging, drawing, quartering, all of this, beheading, this is meant to create a spine in the offender. And that's why spine and crucifixion are related in Arabic. We also have in mythology the story of Odin. Odin, just like Jesus Christ in Christianity, was hanged. But he wasn't hanged from a pole or a makeshift wooden frame. He was actually hanged from a tree, a very important tree, because this tree is the world tree. And so in a Christian context, hanging in heaven would refer to the crucifixion. But remember that Woden or Odin, there is a parallel, perhaps a better one, crucifixion associated with learning. They tell us that Odin was crucified in an analogous way to Jesus Christ. Odin recounts his self-sacrifice. Isn't Jesus supposed to also give a self-sacrifice in Christianity? I know that I hung on a windy tree nine long nights, wounded with a spear. Isn't Jesus Christ also wounded with a spear as well? On that tree to which no man knows from where its roots run, no bread did they give me, nor a drink from a horn. We also are shown bread and wine when it comes to what? The crucifixion. This is my body. This is my blood. We're also shown in the Quran. You, companion, you will serve wine. You, other companion, you, the bread on your head, is actually your head being eaten. Your head is being beheaded from these birds and you are crucified. Okay? Odin, sacrificing himself upon Yggdrasil, the world axis, the spine of the worlds. This is what he was hanged on, a tree, because it's ambiguous. While the name of the tree is not provided in the poem and other trees do exist in Norse mythology, the tree is near universally accepted as the cosmic tree, Yggdrasil. And if the tree is, is Yggdrasil, then the name Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil, directs directly, directly relates to this story. Odin is associated with hanging and gallows. Again, because hanging, crucifixion, impalement, all of these are synonymous in mythology and in history. So let's look at Osiris. Osiris is mentioned in the Quran as Ozeir. He has a similar story because what happens is, I'm just going to introduce Osiris a bit because he is known to be a dying god, exactly like Odin, exactly like Jesus Christ. And then Pharaoh also lives in Egypt as well. This is where they worshipped Osiris in Egypt. When his brother Set cut him up into pieces, right, into pieces, Killing him, Osiris' wife, Isis, found all the pieces and wrapped his body up, enabling him to return to life. So he actually resurrects after his killing, after his demise. He is thought to be syncretist with Yah. This is where the word Yahweh comes from, the moon god. Okay, So Christians like to say that the moon god is in the Quran. It's actually the other way around. The moon god is in the Bible, Yah, Yahweh. All the prophets are named Yah in the Bible, not in the Quran. Osair, or Osiris, was the judge and lord of the dead and the underworld, the lord of silence. This is very interesting. Most people haven't referred to this, but he's called Khenti Amentiu, meaning the foremost of the Westerners. You're going to see why that's important as well with Easter and Westerners. In the Old Kingdom, the Pharaoh was considered a son of God, the son of the sun, the son of God. This is a mythology in all world cultures. And so after his death, he ascends and joins Ra in the sky. They believe he rose from the dead, just like yesterday on Monday, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He is on Sunday, he dies on the day of the sun. He represents death and rebirth. 
and his name in Egyptian hieroglyphs is Usair, Asair, Ausair, Usair, Wesir, Usir. This in the Quran is the person called Uzair. And we know very well that Uzair is mentioned as being is as being venerated as the son of God. Ibn Allah by who? Al Yahud. The Judeans, people of Judea, okay, is directly connected with Egypt. His wife Isis finds the body of Osiris and hides it in the reeds where it is found and dismembered by Seth. Okay? So he's already killed, then he's dismembered, right? As a punishment. Seth fooled Osiris into getting into a box, which Seth then shut, sealed with a lead, and threw into the Nile. So interestingly that Osiris is represented on a pillar as well. And remember when I told you that Pharaoh crucifies or threatens crucifixion in the trunks of the palm trees, right? We have the same thing here. Osiris's wife Isis searched for his remains until she finally found him embedded in a tamarisk tree trunk, within a tree trunk, okay? And this tree trunk was so big, it was holding up the roof of a palace. Where? In Babel, Byblos, Babylon, Phoenicia, Egypt, Persia. This is going to all come full circle when you see all of these things are related. They even put the 72 number in there just to let you know the same people authored this account. Osiris was then murdered by his evil brother Typhon, who was identified with Set. Typhon was divided the body into 26 pieces, which he distributed amongst his fellow conspirators in order to implicate them in the murder. We have even a story of Beni Israel on the Quran where they killed a man and they disputed what happened because it seems like many people were implicated in the murder. The ceremonies were fertility rites, which symbolized the resurrection of Osiris. There's a ritual reenactment of Osiris's funeral rites and were held in the last month of the inundation, coinciding with spring. Many holidays around this story's time in the Quran, many holidays around this one story are always around spring. And I'm going to show you that very clearly. The body of Osiris was taken from his temple in this reenactment during this holiday to his tomb just like Jesus. The boat he was transported in is a bark, like the bark of a tree. He was reborn at dawn. Molds were made from the wood of a red tree in the form of 16 dismembered parts of Osiris. They even had cakes or bread from that crucifixion. Okay. This is the dying God archetype. And the Quran tells you who it is. Isis being one of the main characters of this myth, she resurrects her slain brother and husband because they practiced incest back then. The divine king Osiris and produces and protects his heir Horus. Horus, Christ. This, this is how we call Christ in many languages. Har, Hru, Christ. Christ. Okay? She is called Wusa or Wusa or Ost, or Esti, or West, Est. There's many different versions of her name, and Isis is probably the most um, misleading of them. Notice that she was wearing horns as well. Let me show you something here. This archetype of the Queen of Heaven directly implicates the holiday Easter with this spring holiday for Osiris' death as well. Okay, because remember, they're fertility rites, and it was coinciding with spring. A lot of people say that officially Ishtar has nothing to do with Easter. I'm going to show you that that's actually nonsense, because this epithet, Queen of Heaven, is a title given to a number of ancient sky goddesses worshipped through the Mediterranean and Near East. They are known by many names. Look at the names of these goddesses. <clears throat> Inanna, Anat, Isis, Nut, Astarte, 
Asherah. Okay. One of them is actually called Ishtar. In Akkad to the north, she was worshipped as Ishtar, Easter, Inanna, Isis, Astarte, Asherah in the Bible. Asherah is related with a pole. They call the Asherah pole. On my way to the east, this is Inanna's words in a proto-Euphratean. Uh, it's called the Sumerian descent of Anana. Okay. On my way to the east, Astarte and Asherah. Astart. Astart. Doesn't that tell you the story of Esther, Easter, Ishtar? Of Babylon notice that it's also related with a star as well within a circle indicating the planet Venus Asherah was worshipped in ancient Israel as the consort or wife of El which is another syncretic this is they make statues of Baal exactly like that and Yah as well and in Judah as the consort of Yah remember this was the moon god as well that they put as they gave him a wife, right? Allah doesn't have a wife. Allah doesn't have a son. So, seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah? This is in the book of Jeremiah. Children gather wood. The fathers light the fire. And the women knead the dough and make cakes of bread for the queen of heaven. Didn't we just talk about this for Osiris? They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Didn't we just talk about wine and bread in the Quran? Okay. And why is wood being gathered as well? Most biblical scholars tend to regard Astarte, Asherah, Anat, Isis, Ishtar, Inanna as one goddess, queen of heaven. And she's always put as these horned crown, which is called a solar crown. This solar crown known as the radiant crown, is also called the eastern crown or tyrant's crown, okay, of tyrants. It may also be worn by pharaohs, okay. You see this all throughout the ancient world. You see it all throughout mythology. And where do we see Babel and Babylon as well having this solar crown? It's actually in America. In France, in the West, Louis of France is wearing this crown as the Sun King. Okay. This is the goddess today. She's in New York City, the Statue of Liberty. She's even holding a fire. So this crown of thorns is actually from this story. It's from Egypt. It's from Babylon. It's from Phoenicia from Carthage, from Persia. Why am I putting all these places as one? Because you're going to see they are all one. And Eset, remember I told you that Isis means, the way you pronounce her name in Egyptian is Eset, Eseti, Esi. <laughs> this is how people say Jesus as well. Wusa, Esti, East, East. She's associated with magic and motherhood. Yes. Who else is, has the same name? Esther. Esther. This is in Hebrew. This is a book in the Old Testament. The book of Esther. Said to be borrowed from Old Persian meaning star. From Proto-Iranian Heshta. Eshta. Esta. Just like, just like Isis. Ishtar. If anyone believes that Ishtar has nothing to do with Easter, it's right there plain as day. We already told you that the star was associated with this queen of heaven. They took a human being and they turned her into a goddess. They did the same with men as well. They turned them into gods. Same with the prophets. And that's why we have so many pantheons around the world. The biblical character Esther, okay, it's a female given name, is related to Ishtar and Easter. Remember Inanna? Is towards the east. They tell you that it's not plausible that Easter has anything to do with Ishtar. 
But I already showed you that Easter is derived from Esther, from Ishtar, the dawn. Remember when that festival of Osiris was being celebrated around the spring equinox, just like Easter, just like Purim, just like Passover, okay? Estra, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of the dawn, surprise, surprise, whose festival is thought to have been celebrated around the vernal or spring equinox. Austra, we have countries called Austria to this day to commemorate this person. East, dawn, east, the doublet of east. Of course, as they say, it's not related to Ishtar. <laughs> it is. Easter, this is the word Easter, by the way. Easter is related to a goddess, officially, of the spring equinox. And it's related to the start of the calendar. Ostara, in honor of the goddess Ostara, the Jewish Passover is what Easter is. This is, Passover is in the time of Moses. Passover is the Last Supper. Esther is way back, way after Moses and way before Jesus. And that happens in Persia. Musa happens in, in uh, Egypt. And Mary and Jesus happens in Judea, Judea. So how can all these stories all be connected? Well, the Quran gives you the answer. Notice, this Ishtar is a goddess in the Babylonian pantheon, which I already showed you. Byblos is where Osiris was killed. Byblos is associated with Venus, a star, a five-pointed star. A counterpart to the Sumerian Inanna, Astarte which is all, is all Easter, Esther, Ashtarte, Ashtoreth, Asherah, a pole, okay? And so we have a goddess mentioned in the Quran as well, which is really just Isis backwards. So if you go to Isis, what it means, they call her Wusa, Wusa, Wusa. And here is just a changing a bit. You have Sua. Sua, the West Arabian goddess of the night, consort of the lunar god, okay, like Ya, like El. Sculpture of a woman had an idol, goddess of the night, that was situated in a temple. Of course, it's a goddess of the night because the goddesses were presented with stars which come out at night. Springs and fountains found in the vicinity of her cult site, okay, just like Egypt had springs and fountains between beneath the kingdom of Firam. We see that Eli Sheba, if you just divide this, Eli Sheba, this word is Suwa. It has it right there, Sabawa. But the Ba in Hebrew is ambiguous because it can be a Va as well. So the Va and Wa are also ambiguous in Hebrew. What we have here is El Suwa. El Sawa. This is where we get the word Elizabeth from. Okay. Interestingly enough, there's an Elizabeth that's the wife of Harun in the Bible. Okay. The high priest of Israel. There's also in the chapter of Luke, Elisava, El Sawa, El Sawa. They just don't pronounce the Ain at the end. El Sawa. Elizabeth. He's a descendant of Aaron and the wife of Zechariah. So in the New Testament, they just copy the same person and they make her Zechariah's wife, who's also a Jewish priest, just like Harun. Elizabeth was also the same wife of Zechariah, a relative of Miriam, and the mother of John the Baptist, okay, who they call Yahya. This is where we get the word Alish Alishba. Isabella, Isabel, Elizabeth. It's a very prevalent name. And funny enough, I'm going to show you there were two rulers that they give us in our sanitized history called Elizabeth and Mary as well. Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. But let me show you um, more on this name. This is a queen of Carthage, which the Romans called Dido, but the Greeks called Elisa. Okay, Elisa. This is a shortening of Elisua, right? And she's the founder of Carthage, 
the legendary founder of Carthage, which means new city, Qadiyat, new Qadiyya, okay, founder of Carthage, all right. Again, mythology corroborates the Bible, which corroborates the Quran. Everything comes back to the Quran because this person is going to be very important in this story. I know you're wondering, where is the crucifixion part? I'm going to get to it. This fortress is called Babylon. And Babylon, according to this fortress's name, is in Egypt. This is actually in Cairo. Funny enough, ancient Roman fortress is on the eastern bank of the Nile Delta in Cairo. Egypt was never called Masr back in the day. It was called Qibit, Kemet, Copt. And basically what we see here is that Babylon is associated with Egypt in very ancient times. The actual city of Cairo was called Babylon. And they just had to invent a story that Nebuchadnezzar, from the story of Prophet Daniel, is actually the one who named Cairo Babylon. Okay? Let me show you what I mean. On old maps, what do we see here? Do we see Cairo? No. We see Babylon. Just right here where this magnifying glass here. This is where Cairo is today. There is no Cairo, it's Babylon. I'm not saying that Egypt and Babylon and Cairo are in North Africa, but clearly people remembered that Cairo and Babylon, very much Biblos, Babylon, Bibelon, Biblos, Bible, are all related to Pharaonic Egypt. They're related to Egypt. They have the word Egyptus right here, Alexandria right here, but Babylon right where Cairo would be, okay? And uh, we'll have to get into it another time where America fits into that, but um, let me just show you this, okay? This is a chart I created to show you the consistencies Okay, between these books of the Bible, okay? And why the Bible simply copies different details of the same story again and again, okay? These stories, the blue ones are from Egypt. The green ones are the connections between Persia and Egypt. The red ones are from Persia and the purple ones are from Judea in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, we have Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Moses, and they usually identify this Pharaoh with Ramesses II. He reigns for 70 years, during which time he subjugates the children of Israel as slaves. Okay? In Persia, we have a king called Nebuchadnezzar II. Again, the second. He takes the children of Israel, Judeans. They're called Jews at this point, Judeans, but they're still the children of Israel in the Bible. He takes them as captives of war, and they are in a captivity or Babylonian enslavement for 70 years. All right. In Judea, a long time after, King Herod of Judea orders the slaughter of infants, just like Pharaoh, okay, of the children of Israel in Bethlehem. Around 70 years later, the Romans siege Jerusalem and the Israelites are exiled. Okay. So clearly... 70 years plays a role in here, and we can see that the Pharaonic rulers are the Babylonian and the Persian rulers and the Judean rulers that afflicted the worst punishments upon Beni Israel, exactly as it says in the Quran. Prophet Yusuf is put in a prison with two companions, and he interprets the vision of the king because of his gift of interpreting the future from God. Prophet Joseph warns of a seven-year-long famine in the coming years, and Prophet Moses brings a deficiency in fruits whereby Pharaoh must eat grass to quench his thirst. This is in the Bible. So in the Bible, Pharaoh eats grass because there's a famine, there's a shortage of water because of these signs that Moses brings, exactly like the Quran says, deficiency in fruits, seven-year-long long famine of Joseph, exactly like in the Quran. 
what we see in the Persian story, the Babylonian story, is Prophet Daniel. Prophet Daniel, you're going to see, is very similar to Prophet Joseph, Prophet Yusuf's story. Prophet Daniel is put in a dungeon with three companions in Babylon, and he interprets the vision of the king because of his gift of interpreting the future from God. Prophet Daniel warns that a famine will transpire for seven seasons, and the king will eat grass in the field like the wild ox. Okay? We also see the mention of a famine by Josephus. Again, Joseph, another Joseph, the name of a Joseph, Jewish historian at the time. He recounts that the king Herod, who's killing the infant children of Israel, averts a famine by using the royal treasury to purchase food and supplies from Rome. Do you know that Yusuf in the Quran is appointed to the treasury? Okay. And there's a famine averted, supposedly, by the king, right? So what we see is Prophet Yusuf is Prophet Daniel. And the king of Babylon is akin to the king of Egypt. And the seven seasons of famine in Babylon is just like the seven years of famine in Egypt. And this is also related to the deficiency in fruits in Egypt. And the deficiency of fruits brought as a sign of the nine great signs brought to Prophet Musa. Firaun hungers in the Bible exactly like the Babylonian king hungers at Prophet Daniel's time. We have a vizier Haman in the Quran who advises the king of the king Firaun of Egypt and is involved with the slaughter of the children of Israel. He is because it says Firaun, Haman and Qarun are involved in the slaughter of Beni Israel their sons. In Persia, the Babylonian vizier is called Haman. And in the story of Esther, the Bible tells us that King Ahasuerus is advised as by this Haman, and this Haman attempts to exterminate the Jews, the children of Israel. So we see that the Babylonian vizier Haman of the Bible is none other than the Egyptian vizier Haman of the Quran. And King Ahasuerus is exactly like Pharaoh. Obviously, the details are changed, but you have to see this, the forest for the trees. Pharaoh's wife is the queen of Egypt. She rescues a young infant Musa from a decree passed to slaughter the children of Israel in the Bible, and in doing so, sows the seeds to their emancipation from Pharaoh. In Persia, Queen Esther is enabled by her marriage to the king of Persia, and her heroism manages to save the children of Israel from extinction. In Judah, in Judea, at the time of Jesus, Elizabeth is thought in Islam to be the daughter of Imran's wife, Hannah's sister, who in Christianity is referred to as Soba, Soa, or Ismeria. Again, it's related to Soa. Elisaba, Elisaba, Soba, Soa. So we see that Pharaoh's wife is likely related to Queen Esther in the book of Esther. And Pharaoh is the king of Persia. That's why we have Pharisees as well. I'll get to that. The salvation of the children of Israel from the Babylonian captivity is, not, is almost identical. It's similar to the emancipation from Pharaoh via Musa. The wife of Al-Aziz in the Quran is responsible for imprisoning Joseph and she holds a banquet to display Yusuf's beauty. The king of Egypt in Joseph's time is called Pharaoh and on his birthday, okay, his birthday, he hangs one of Yusuf's companions who he foretold was going to be hanged and Yusuf interprets his dream showing the future demise of Egypt and Pharaoh's dominion. Okay, The ruler in Musa's time is called Pharaoh, Pharaoh, and Musa humiliates Pharaoh on the day of adornment, okay, Yom Zina in the Quran, when Pharaoh orders the magicians to be hanged and crucified. After the exposing of the wife of Al Aziz in the Quran at the hands of the other of the women of the banquet, Yusuf is exalted to the position of Al Aziz. This happens with Daniel as well. Daniel is also exalted after a banquet of Belshazzar. So King Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes, 
he's humiliated at a la large banquet by his former wife Vashti uh, when she refuses to adorn herself in his honor and so he marries Esther. Instead, because of her beauty, uh, and then Haman is also executed by crucifixion hanging in the same story, impalement also, which he originally intended to execute Mordecai, the cousin and guardian of Esther. Okay. Belshazzar, in the, pro in the prophet Daniel's story, the son of King Nebuchadnezzar, has a great feast with vessels from the plundering of the first temple. And this results in Prophet Daniel being exalted to a very high position in the land because of his interpretive abilities, exactly like Yusuf becoming Al-Aziz. In Judea, King Herod holds a feast. Again, what are the odds? Everyone has a banquet for the same basic reason. A feast for his birthday celebration, just like Pharaoh in the time of Joseph. And his stepdaughter, Salome, um, in which he gifts her with the severed head of prisoner John the Baptist. Again, severing heads, crucifixion. Salome is depicted as a female seductress similar to the wife of Al-Aziz in the Quran. Yeshua, Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ is sentenced to crucifixion by the Pharisees. Pharisees in Pharisee means Persian in Arabic. It's also related to pharaohs, pharaohs, okay? The pharaohs, he's associated with them. So the Persians actually sentenced Jesus to crucifixion. The Persians have Babylon, and the Persians, Babylon is in Egypt, where pharaoh rules. So Yeshua, there seems to be some confusion as to who was actually crucified, exactly like in the Quran, the Yahud, they say, indeed, we have crucified him, but I'm going to show you, no, that's not the case. Because there's two Jesuses. One is called Yeshua, son of the father, and one is called Yeshua bar Abbas, which also means son of the father. Mary has a husband in the Bible who is referred to as Saint Joseph. So there's also a Joseph in Judea. There's a Joseph called Daniel at the time of, in Persia, and there's a Joseph in Egypt at the time of Moses and before Moses, apparently. It's like they're all not at the same time. I would be very surprised if they're not. So this St. Joseph is a stepfather of Jesus because Jesus has no biological father in the Bible as well as in the Quran. The wife of Al-Aziz appears to be related to, to be related somewhat to the story of Vashti or Wasti, Wast, Est, okay? Being seen as a negative character, both in the Quran as well as in the Bible. Haman intends to crucify and hang the guardian of Esther, Mordecai, Notice that Miriam also has a guardian called Zechariah, okay? Um, and just like Pharaoh and the Pharaoh of the Bible intend to hang the magicians in the Quran and Joseph's companion respectively. Yeshua in the Bible, Jesus Christ in the Bible, seems to be also threatened with crucifixion by the Pharaoh sees, Pharisees, Persians. We see that the immoral advances of the wife of Al-Aziz against Yusuf is likely reconciled later. And this is partly conjecture as well because we have no idea. But it's just interesting to draw comparisons that um, Miriam is known to be somebody that guarded her chastity. Yusuf is also somebody known to guard his chastity. And is it just a coincidence in the Bible we have a stepfather, a kind of guardian type husband-like figure with Mary and she has a son that's not jo Saint Joseph's biological son named Jesus Christ. Mordecai is also similar to the Quranic Zechariah as well because both Mordecai and Zechariah cast lots. That's why the festival is called Purim, the story of Esther, because it's about casting lots in the Quran. Zechariah is the one that does that to give guardianship over Mary, okay? And the same thing happens with Mordecai and Esther as well. So they blended all of these stories in the Quran to make them different stories to produce a narrative which doesn't make any sense and it's, there's no evidence for. So they can just basically show the Quran to be inaccurate. And really, it's the Bible even plagiarizes itself. It's, it's a book of hadith. 
That's what the Bible is. Moses' sister in the Bible is called Miriam. And his brother is called Aaron. And his father is called Amram. In the Quran, Miriam is a daughter of Imran or Amram. Miriam is the sister of Musa because she's called the sister of Harun. Musa being the brother of Harun, Aaron. There is also enslavement of the children of Israel in Egypt. So Miriam being the sister of Musa in the Quran, makes it makes perfect sense that she would be the sister to give Moses up to the household of Pharaoh, where the wife of Pharaoh adopts Musa as a son. She says he will be the coolness of my spring. Okay. In the Quran, Miriam heads to an easterly place, place to which she conceives Isa, Jesus, after being informed by the angel. In the Bible, Mary's cousin or aunt, it's unclear whether she's a cousin or aunt, is Elizabeth, Eli, Elisaba, Esua, Eshava. We see that there's a correlation between Hebrew Shava and Arabic goddess Sua. We have a copy of this in sanitized history with famous queens called Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> the latter being called the Virgin Queen. Elizabeth is called the Virgin Queen. When in reality, this is applicable to Mary, the Virgin Queen. So you see, they do this in history, in secular history, in biblical history, in Islamic history, you'll probably find cor cor uh, parallels, and also in mythological history as well. And then finally, we see that the story of Moses and Aaron and the freeing of the children of Israel from Pharaoh's yoke is celebrated as what? In the spring as Passover or Pesach, where a lamb is traditionally slaughtered. Okay? The story of Jesus Christ his alleged crucifixion by the Pharisees, the Persians, as the lamb offering for the spiritual church of Israel, because the Christians are called Israel now in Christianity, freeing them from bondage by sin. So they're, they're enslaved by sin and Jesus' crucifixion as the lamb offering, crucified by the Pharaohs for the spiritual church of Israel, freeing them from sin by faith in the resurrection, is celebrated when? In the spring, exactly like Passover, as Easter comes from Esther, Ishtar, okay, Isis, which is essentially Pasha, Pak, Pesach, or Passover. In, in Ar Arabic, the word for Easter is actually Passover, Pesach, okay? You can look it up. This is the Last Supper meal, in the official story of the New Testament. The Last Supper meal is a Passover Seder meal. The story of Esther in Persia is all about freeing her people from slavery. The Beni Israel. Esther and Easter. There's a Haman in the story, just like there's a Haman in the story of Passover. Sorry, the story of Musa in the Quran. Okay? The story of Passover in the Bible. And basically... We even have a crucifixion of Haman in the story of Esther. In the story of Joseph, we have a crucifixion or hanging of his companion. And in the story of Moses, we have um, in the Quran a crucifixion of the magicians. So all the stories have the same thing as well. And of course, Purim is the festival which they celebrate in spring around the vernal equinox. All of them just like Osiris' cult. So we see that Miriam lived in Pharaonic times as the daughter of Amram or Imran, the sister of Musa and Harun, and hence her son Isa is their nephew. She flees from Egypt or Babylon, heading east, because remember, Osiris is called Lord of the West. Easter, Ishtar, Isis. And we know that the Yehud in the Quran worshipped Osiris, Uzair, as the son of God, who was called in history Lord of the Westerners. Pharaoh's wife and Maryam met each other as the two most exalted women in the Quran, because we're told that Musa's sister in the Quran gives Musa as an infant to the wife of Pharaoh. 
the wife of Pharaoh, and very likely is Elizabeth, El Shaba, which is the wife of Zechariah, later, later, after Pharaoh, because, you know, the wife of Pharaoh makes dua to Allah to save her from Pharaoh. She's a righteous woman. And Zechariah's wife seems to be damaged in the Quran, unable to give birth to a son. Um, that's why the birth of Yahya and the birth of Isa are paralleled, just like in the Bible as well. Elizabeth and Zechariah are very old. They can't have children, exactly like Mary. Mary is a virgin. She can't have children if nobody you know, contributes the male portion to procreate Isa. He's made miraculously as a sign like Adam. So there's so much happening here. And Esther has the same notion as well, being a queen in her own right. Daniel being a prophet who sees the future like Yusuf. Okay. So where is this all leading? When we see that this is all talking about the same thing, we know that Beni Israel, the Yahud, the Nasara, Beni Israel basically have killed their prophet. They're killing the prophets. Okay. Taqtalun and Anbiya. Okay. We have here. Uyaqtalun and Anbiya. Which prophet did they kill? We know Isa is a prophet they didn't kill. So clearly there is a prophet they killed. It says here, Al Yahud Urzairun. So say the Yahud, Waqat al Yahud Urzairun ibn Allah. Urzair is the son of Allah. And say the Nasara, Al Masih, the Messiah. The Masih is the son of Allah. That is their saying from their mouths, they imitate those who disbelieve before them. May Allah, dis may Allah fight them, may Allah destroy them. How deluded are they? They're deluded by this. Okay? This is to connect Judea with Osiris in Egypt. And for their saying, again, that is their saying, right? Indeed, we killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam. This is who the actual Jesus Christ is in the Quran. Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, and they killed him not, and they crucified him not. Okay? His crucifixion did not happen to him. Another was made to appear, was made to appear to them. It was made to appear to them that they crucified Isa, the son of Mary. And indeed, the ones who differed in it, they are surely in doubt about it. It was not for them about it from a knowledge, except following assumptions. The assumption. And they killed him not for certain. You see? They killed him not for certain. Why does Allah repeat this in the same verse? They killed him not, they killed him not. Because this is something that is a test for mankind. Okay. Notice the crucifixion first comes onto the scene with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, he says, You believed in him before. Before I gave you permission. Indeed, this is surely a plot you have plotted in the Medina to drive away its from it its people. It's family. In the head of the Macron, Macartumu, who fill Medina, the Tukhrijuminha Ahlaha. Who else are known to be associated with the Medina? The companions of the cave. They say, Take this leaf of yours into the Medina to ascertain which is the best of the food. The Medina again. Fasofa, but soon you will know. This is still Pharaoh's words. I will surely cut your hands and your feet from khilafin. What does khilafin mean? Behind you. It means behind you. Okay? Then I will surely crucify you, hang you, impale you, draw and quarter you, behead you, all. So he's making this threat to these people that are the magicians. And what, what, why do they, he says this because they believe in the God of Musa, in Allah. 
they say inna ila rabbina munqalibun munqalibun indeed toward our lord we will return they're not saying he's going to kill them okay even if he kills them okay they understand something about the world that they will return to him munqalibun to turn to our hearts turn to you. We will move towards him. Okay. What do we see also? Firaun says, you believe in him before I gave you permission towards you. Indeed, he is your chief Musa. So Musa is actually known to be conspiring with these people as if Musa already knows these people. And what they're doing is basically a staged event in front of the citizens of Firam to humiliate him on the day of adornment. Indeed, he is your chief, the one who taught you the sihra. So Firam accuses these people, who I'm going to show you who they are, the magicians, of sihr. When we know very well that they call Musa and his miracles, he call, they call him a magician and they call what he does magic. When we know very well he's he's a prophet of God, he is giving the signs and miracles of God. So Firaun is saying he taught you these miracles because the magicians do the same thing. I will surely cut your hands and your feet from behind you. And I will surely hang you in trunks of the Nakhl, of these trees. Okay? And you will surely know which of us is more severe in punishment and more lasting. They said, never will we prefer you upon what has come to us of the clear proofs. The one who created us and the one who created us. So decree, iqdi. remember, use, you know, uh, Yusuf's companion, he says it's decreed upon you that you will be crucified. Decree whatever you decree. Only, only this, you can only decree this hayat ad dunya. You can't decree the hereafter. Okay. What do we see here? Again, you believed in him before I gave you permission. Indeed, he is your chief, the one who taught you the sahar, the magic. So surely soon you will know I will cut your hands and your feet from opposite sides, from behind you. I will hang you, all of you. They said, no, no harm, indeed. Indeed, towards our Lord, we will turn. Indeed, we desire that we will forgive. He will forgive us. Our Lord, our khatayana, our mistakes, our faults, our errings. He will forgive us for this. Because we were first of the believers. Musa says the same thing. I am first of the believers. These people are in Musa's faction. Musa and these people are the same group. They're believers. Okay. And these are the people who are threatened with crucifixion. Funny enough, it's in the chapter of the poets as well. Do you know in Jewish and Christian traditions, we have their names as Yanis and Yambras. The names given to magicians mentioned in the book of Exodus, okay? And they're not specifically mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, but the Egyptian wise men and sorcerers, notice we also have wise men, three wise men that come to the birth of Jesus Christ in Egypt at the time of Pharaoh, okay? And sorcerers. So they're called wise men, but by Pharaoh they're called sorcerers. Which is it? Are they believers or are they sorcerers? So it says here, then Pharaoh, also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. So now they're called magicians, even though they're just wise men. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. You'll find that the word for sihr actually doesn't really mean magic. But there is sihr, there is a form of sihr that refers to something forbidden. Because... What Musa does is called Seher. He's called a Seher, but it's miracles. He literally turns this staff of his into a dragon. And mind you, it is a dragon because that dragon, 
is called Furban in the Quran. Let me just show you this. Um, okay, so this is a scene from that event. This is Pharaoh in a turban, okay, and he's watching three magicians. Why are there three magicians? Well, there's three dragons, okay, three of them here, and they're all extending their hand out. Okay, They're extending their hand out because their staffs became these three dragons, exactly like Moses, and his staff became this dragon. Okay, in, in Arabic, it's called Thurban, right? It's like a wyvern, a dragon. Notice what they have as well. They have a dog with them, exactly like the companions of the cave as well. You can look at this uh, at another time. Okay. So these people, two of these wise men are called Yanis and Yambris. Okay. And basically, the Babylonian Talmud names them Johanna and Mamri as two of Pharaoh's sorcerers. They actually leave with Musa. They left Egypt at the Exodus to accompany Musa and the Israelites. Okay? They go east with Musa. Easterly. Okay? Just like just like um, what we see there for um, for Miriam, she goes easterly. So here is just showing that from your loins, abna'ikum alladina min aslabikum. This is showing your loins are ref are related to um, the backbone, your backbones, your spines, the sacrum. Okay. Yakhruju min baina sulbi wa taraib, coming forth from between the backbone and the ribs. I'm gonna have to get make another video why this doesn't actually show you at all anything to do with human anatomy other than anal analogizing human anatomy to earthly anatomy. So this is actually a location. Um, I'll, I'll have to get into that another time. So the question is, why, oh why, does the Quran call Jesus Christ Isa, but everywhere else, Arab Christians call him Yasur, the Hebrew calls it Yasur, Yasar, Yashua, Yasha, Isha, Notice the ein placement is at the end. The ein placement in Arabic is at the beginning. The strange spelling is found in the Quran only because the Bible got the person who was crucified wrong. And this subtle difference is enough to hoodwink most of humanity. So Jesus in by Arab Christians is not called ya Isa, he's called Yasur, Yeshua. But if Muslims, he's called Isa because the Quran correctly identifies his true name. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua, Greek, Yesus. Okay, they thought Yesus is the original name. Yeshua is the original name. And the Quran just deviated from that. It still puzzles them to this day. What is the original name of Jesus? I'm here to tell you it's Isa. Okay. Even some 14th century Persian translations of Matthew by Christian groups in Iran show to be Isa. And this is not any evidence anyway. This is just to show you that there is ambiguity. Because this person, Yeshua or Yehoshua, okay, Yah Yeshua, Joshua is the person they call Jesus Christ today. And he's called Joshua ben Nun. Because there's a Joshua in the Old Testament and a Joshua, the son of Mary, in the New Testament. That's why they add the ben Nun at the end to distinguish him from Jesus Christ because they have the same name. So Joshua the high priest, that's another person. Guess when this happens? After the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. If you want any, if there was any doubt that Babylonian captivity is the Egyptian enslavement of Bani Israel, the Egyptian enslavement ends 
and Beni Israel are led by a person called Joshua Ben Nun. The Babylonian captivity ends, and the person have the person who reconstructs the temple is a high priest called Joshua as well. It's the same person. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua as well, Yehoshua. Okay? This is not Isa. Yeshu, Yeho, Yeshua, Yohanan as well. You'll find as well Yahya also is not John. John is Yohanan. It's a different person. So, Yeshua in Hebrew is a verbal derivative to rescue, to deliver. Notice, who delivers the Jews from Babylon? It's Joshua the high priest. Who delivers Musa's people from Egypt and Pharaoh? Joshua ben Nun, the son of Nun. Who delivers the sinners from to salvation? Joshua Christ. Joshua Christ, not Jesus Christ. Not Isa al Masih. Joshua ben Nun is a successor of Moses, the leader of the Israelites in after Egypt. Yeshua was generally transcribed to Jesus in English. It's a theophoric name, meaning a saving cry for help. Shua. Okay. Again, we have Saba again as well. There's something going on here. Um Su'an, it's related to that. So, the Hebrew final letter Ain is equivalent to the final in Syriac. But in Arabic, Jesus' name has the beginning letter as Ain. So we have this person called Elisha. And in Arabic, he's called Elyasa. Not Elyas, Elyasa. Okay? There's an ayin. It's exactly the same name. Al yasa, al yasa. My God is salvation. Do you know this is the definition for Jesus in Hebrew? My God is salvation. Yahushua. Al yasa. It means my God is salvation. He is known to be a miracle worker, a prophet, in the Bible, and you're gonna find that he did almost identical things that Jesus Christ did in the Bible. You can see why in the Quran, al is the crucified person. He is the person that is confused with Isa, al Isa. He is a companion of the cave. I'm going to show you that, inshallah. Here he has a picture of al Elisha, the prophet Elisha, who raises someone from the dead. Exactly like Isa is in the Quran. Okay? So, when you look at it, Isa multiplied foods like oil. Didn't Jesus Christ do the same thing in the Quran? Well, not in the Quran, but specifically in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus multiplies bread. He multiplies fish, which is analogous to the table spread. Right in, in the Quran from Isa. And then we also have Eli, Eliasa, Elisha obtains for a rich lady the birth of a son. When the child died for some years later, Eliasa successfully resuscitated the child. So he brought him from the dead. Doesn't Jesus Christ in the Quran and in the New Testament raise people from the dead? Right? Like a girl from the dead? Also, we notice that al makes food not poisonous. He made a pottage made from poisonous gourds into wholesome food. He fed a hundred men with 20 loaves of new barley. That means he multiplied the food, leaving some left over. In a story which is comparable with the miracles of Jesus in the New Testament. You see, they were confused. That's why they followed assumption. They are still confused. This is why this is a sign. The person Christians pray to on that cross is not Jesus Christ. It's Elisha, al Yasa, Yasur, al Yasur, Yehoshua, Joshua, Jesus, not Isa. 
Al-Yasa also cured the Syrian military commander of leprosy. Isa in the Quran cures someone of leprosy. Jesus Christ in the Quran or in, in the Bible, cons he cures someone of leprosy. This person does this in the Old Testament. And it goes on and on and on and on. Okay, According to the Quran, Al-Yasa, Elisha, is exalted above the worlds. Faddalna ala alameen. He is among the excellent min al akhyar. Islamic sources that identify al yasha with Khidr cite the strong relationship between al Khidr and al yasa Watch the first part of this series, and that will spell doubt that al Khidr is anyone other than Yusuf. Now I'm telling you the person on the cross is Alisha, al Yasa. You see? Jesus and Yusuf. You can see Yusuf and Joshua are have a strong relationship the Quran points to. And you can find these verses in the Quran. He's not mentioned except a few times. There's no mention of his story except other than some Islamic scholars. If you go to Alicia in, in Islam, I mean, all we have is his tombs and some, two references with in the Quran here. That's it. Where is his story in the Quran? It's clearly there. Just people haven't looked. Let's look at Joshua. Joshua's in the Old Testament as well. He's one of 12 spies of Israel sent by Musa to explore the land of Canaan. Okay? We have this story in the Quran as well. There's a faithful attendant of Musa mentioned in the Quran before Musa meets Khidr. We don't know if it's before Musa meets Khidr. It could be after. But they believe this attendant is Yusha. Remember I told you in part one, the attendant, the Fatahu of Musa, is a companion of the cave? Doesn't it tell you Joshua would have to be a companion of the cave now? Leads his people to salvation? You'll see what Joshua does, the miracles he performs as a prophet. His name means salvation, just like Jesus Christ, Yehoshua. God is salvation. Okay. In modern Greek, Joshua is called Jesus, son of now, to differentiate him from Jesus. Noon. Okay, what is Nun? Isn't that associated with Yunus? Isn't that associated with some kind of a creature or a Hut, which Musa sees with his companion and with Khidr? Joshua was a major figure in the events of the Exodus. He was charged by Moses with selecting and commanding a militia group for their first battle after exiting Egypt against the Amalekites, the Rephidim, in which they were victorious. Notice, these Amalekites, this word in Arabic today means giants. Amalek, that means giant in Arabic. What else means giant? Jabarin, titans. These people are not just regular tyrannical strength people because Allah is not called a tyrant. Tyrant, 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 jabar. Allah means something irresistible, meaning he is the titan. He's bigger than you can imagine. I'm not describing tr physical traits of God. I'm saying that Allah is of the capacity of what we would call giants, but to an infinite extent. That's why these Jabbarin, you see, they said, Oh Moses, indeed in it are Amalekites, giant people. Indeed, we will never enter it until they leave from it. And if they leave from it, then certainly we will enter it. Said two men from the ones who feared Allah. Two men, Rajulain, right? Upon them both, enter upon them, enter upon them the gate. Okay? And when they entered it, it says, indeed, you will be victorious. And upon Allah, put your trust. If you are believers, they said, O oh Musa, indeed, never will we enter it ever, as long as they are in it. So go, you and your Lord, and fight. Need we are here sitting. Okay? 
Amalekites in the Quran, Amalekites in the Bible. He later, if he, there's any doubt, I mean, this is what it means. Okay, you can just look at it in here. Jabbar, chief of the Amalekites, sons of Esau, first of the nations. He later accompanied Musa when he ascended Mount Sinai to commune with God. Joshua was with Moses when he descended from the mountain, heard the Israelite celebrations around the golden calf. I already told you there's 12 people. At some point, there are 12 companions of the cave in total. God appoints Joshua to succeed Musa as leader of the Israelites, along with giving him a blessing of invincibility during his lifetime. If this person was crucified, hypothetically, he could be resuscitated by Isa. He could be crucified only in, in appearance that they cr uh, killed him. So there's so many possibilities what happened, but we have to understand this person is not Isa. He's a different person. He's so interesting. He actually commands the sun and moon to stand still so he could finish the battle in the daylight. According to the text, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. They fought battles. And um, this is what we see. As a witness to their promise to serve God, Joshua set up a great stone under an oak by the sanctuary of God. A great tree, a great temple, a great stone. That's where he's buried. He's not buried in all these, you know, ludicrous places, they say. This is why they tell you the book of Joshua is not factual on historical events, because mythology shows you the truth. Okay? So there is a person in the Quran that comes running, comes striving. Yasa, Yasa. And this person is mentioned in the story of Moses and the story of Yasin. I'm going to show you. So basically what happens is Musa is in Egypt before he's about to flee. Okay, You want to become a tyrant. A giant in the ark, armed, right? People were afraid of these Jabbar people, right? And you want that to be from the Muslihin, right? This is what one of the people says to Musa. And there came to Musa a man from Aqsa al Medina, again, the Medina of the companions of the cave, the Medina of Fir'aun, Aqsa al Medina til Yasa. He says, Ya Musa, the chiefs are taking counsel by you to kill you. So leave. Indeed, I am to you of the sincere advisors, Nasihin. This is identical to what we see in Surah Yasin. Okay? So they want to stone these two messengers, strengthened by a third. And then... وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْسَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسَعَ There came from the farthest end of the Medina a, a man striving, running. So why is this in Surah Yasin? Because on one Aqsa of the Medina, he is telling his people, follow the messengers, the Mursaleen, of which Musa is one of them. Harun is one of them. Yusuf would also be one of them. Follow them, O my people. Then he goes to the other Aqsa and he tells Musa, leave, they're going to kill you. It's the same person. There's no way around it. Yasin is related to the city, al Medina of Fir'aun. Just look where this word is used. al Medina. This Medina is something really important. It's used with Pharaoh. It's used with Al-Aziz, Yusuf's story. It's used with Qawm Lut's story, al Medina. It's used with the companions of the cave. It's used with Prophet Muhammad's story, al Medina. There's no way Medina is going to be there with all of these stories as is. It's used with the story of Thamud as well. Okay. Just look where this thing is used. And there's more than one of them. There's exactly three of them. 
So when you look at this root, yasa, yasa, this is not the same root as sa'i. Sa'i is the one where you're walking or traveling or striving. But isn't it interesting that in Arabic as well, al yasa is the same root as yasur, what Arab Christians call Jesus of Nazareth. It's also the same people as Yasu'i, Yasu'i, Jesuits, okay? People of Joshua, Joshua, the Yasa'i, al Yasa'i. This is a very important person in the Quran, and they've confused him with Jesus. They've crucified him instead of Jesus. He was a companion of the cave. He was one of the people in the Sijin of Yusuf here. Who says, indeed, you will be crucified, the, the birds will eat from your head. And so, sa'i meaning, you know, ambulating, okay, uh, to move or crawl forward, to walk, to pass along one's way, to, ca to be cause bring about one's own destruction. This is where it's used as well, to move across the sky like the moon. Perhaps this is probably how he got through the Medina. I'm not sure, but somebody who strives, endeavors, aspires, seeks towards something, a goal. To work towards something, striving, chasing after, running after. Okay? Sa'i bayna safa wal marwa. Walking up and down between safa and marwa. To take steps in a matter. Slender somebody, discredit somebody, to betray somebody. A messenger, a courier, delivery man. And again, this is related to su'a'an. Okay? I mean, we can look at that up right now as well. So if you go on this website and you try to find this su'a'an, right? Wasi'a means, um, you know, spaciousness, right? This means transit. Su'a, it's used for a quarter of an hour. It's used for the hour, a sa'a. Okay. So I hope you enjoy that. You have some better idea of the crucifixion, the companions of the cave, the story of Yusuf, the complete fabrication of our history when it comes to Babylon, Byblos, Mesur, Egypt, um, Persia, uh, and hopefully. You have an understanding now why Christians call Jesus this name instead of this one. Because it appears that Yeshua, Joshua, Aliasa is the actual person who was crucified. He was a companion of the cave and Yusuf's companion in prison. And he was also with Musa after Pharaoh. Thank you so much, and until the next time, peace.